Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I discovered Dickie's Barbershop that we have at the Freedom Square area here at Discovery Park. And uh, while not the original from the early 1900s in Reeve, Tennessee, our founder, Robert Kirkland, had it measured to a T so it would be rebuilt exactly how it was. It is, and that's a really fun area out there. I was just out there yesterday. Um, it's really pretty. They've got it landscaped, a lot of work going on around the stage over there. And of course, that's where you go to see the Liberty Bell that, mm-hmm. that was cast from the original Liberty Bell that has a, a crack in it. Um, today's guest, however, would not have a crack if he had built the Liberty Bell. Sean Kenny is a renowned award-winning artist who uses Lego toys to create exhibitions, pop art, portraiture, children's books, and more. His exhibitions have been touring globally since 2012, and he's authored nine children's books. He's judged the hit TV show Lego Masters. Um, He's got a whole group of sculptures that are coming to Discovery Park this summer from May 3rd to September 2nd. I'm so excited to have Sean Kenny here with us today. Welcome, Sean. So, Sean, did you exhibit uh, skills as a Lego artist almost from the beginning as a boy? Yeah, I mean, I've been, well, I've been building and playing with Lego bricks ever since I was two probably, but uh, I've been I've been doing this professionally for nearly 20 years now. Um, so um, in 2005, I actually opened up my art studio in New York City, um, and I have been displaying uh, my artwork at art galleries and in corporate lobbies. I've been doing corporate commissions and, um, you know, products for people like, you know, I'll do portraits of kids for grandmas as gifts and all kinds of different things. So I've been doing that for two decades or so now. Um, and for the last uh, probably 10 or 15 years, well, over 10 years anyway, um, I've been uh, taking my my artwork out on tour. And so Nature Connects, which is coming to Discovery Park soon, um, was the first exhibition that I ever created. And I created it back in 2012, I think. So it's been touring for about 12 years. Um, although I'm always adding new sculptures to it and, and changing it up and making it new and different and interesting. So, um, I've been lucky that, uh, nature connects and my other exhibitions have been able to travel the world. Really. They've been all around the United States. They've been out as far as China and Taiwan, Australia, and all points across Europe and, uh, all kinds of different places. So, uh, I'm really excited actually to, to bring them to Tennessee now. Yes, we um, have some things that are specifically included for Discovery Park because obviously we have 50 acres of grounds that are filled with uh, gardens and and two lakes. And, and so we, we added the eagle and I know we have the, the gardener with the push mower. And anyway, so it's going to be really cool. I'm, I'm excited to see what they actually look like. Uh, when we get them on place here. So, Zach, did you play with Legos when you were a kid? I did a little bit, but we just got my son some Legos for Christmas and this past December, and he actually just turned two. I thought it was a little too early, but hearing that Sean started at that age, maybe not. Maybe it wasn't too early. I played with Lincoln Logs. I don't <laughs> really remember playing with Legos too much, but um, I do now as an adult. Uh, when, do you know when you got your first Lego set? I know people ask me when when did you get your first Lego set, and I was like, I'm like, I don't know. When did you meet your mother? I, I just it's one of those things that's always been there in my life. I have no, I, it's just always been there. <laughs> yeah, I think the kits that you can buy now um, are a lot more elaborate than the ones that I bought when I was a kid. They have you know all different types of um, colors and shapes and and guides, almost like a puzzle you put together. Uh, I know your studio is really cool. Tell us about your studio and what you have there. Yeah, so my studio uh, is located in the historic center of Amsterdam. So I've got a beautiful cobblestone street and some canals and trams and art museums literally right out my window. Um, And on the inside, it's this big, white, beautiful box with skylights and big windows out to the street. And um, it's filled with about one and a half million Lego bricks, which I have arranged by, by color, like a rainbow along the wall in clear bins. 
Um, and uh, I keep them all organized so that I can find exactly what I need. Um, I usually have probably a whole bunch of different projects going on at once. You know, I'll be building big sculptures on the floor. I've got artwork hanging up on the walls and all kinds of things. Um, and so I, uh, I don't have any special pieces or any special colors. I have all just regular Lego pieces like you, you, you can get in the toy store. In fact, there's nothing I have that you can't get in a toy store. I just have a lot more of it. <laughs> and um, I, I think that's actually actually one of the really cool things about creating art with Lego bricks because I have everything the kids have um, and I can just use my creativity and my skills to try to create things that people have never seen before. Yeah, I didn't realize how many different colors of Lego bricks that there were until I saw the videos of you in your studio. How many colors are there actually? Believe it or not, there are not that many colors. I, I use about 25 different colors and there are max about 40 or so um which compared to a painter who has literally billions of shades of different you know colors at their disposal it makes it um a different sort of challenge for me to try to figure out how i'm gonna you know interpret something you know if i'm creating a a flower right uh, i might look at it and say all right well this is kind of a purpley blue so i've got purple and i've got blue and i don't have anything in between and so how do i decide what i'm going to make this flower look like and and it's actually a really fun challenge i I feel like I feel like creating art with Lego is a lot like the the art world of found materials, right? Where you sort of have to try to see what you've got and make something with it instead of having the sort of ultimate blank canvas of of a paintbrush or a pencil. Um, and yet at the same time, it is sort of the ultimate creativity because you are building something up from nothing at the same time. So it's this really interesting combination. And the inside of these sculptures, is there anything in there holding them together and holding them up or is it all Legos inside? Yeah. So um, when I build the sculptures, they're they're actually all glued piece by piece, one by one as I go. So there's no cheating. All the pieces are connected the way that Lego bricks are meant to connect together. Um, right. But I use industrial solvents basically to fuse the plastic together because if I'm going to take these things on the road, I want to make sure you know they hold up. If if you or your kids have ever taken a Lego model halfway across the house to show mom or somebody and it didn't quite make it all the way, <laughs> you have a a small small appreciation for what what it's like when I stick my sculptures, something I spent maybe three months on into a crate and, and handed to a, a guy with a forklift and <laughs> cross my fingers. So so all the pieces are glued together one by one, just like laying a brick wall, you know, put down some Lego bricks, put down some glue, put down some bricks one by one as I go row by row. Uh, inside the sculptures, there's usually some beams and grids that I build out of Lego bricks just to kind of keep things square and straight and level. Um, and then I also will usually run a piece of metal through them. Um, and the metal just kind of helps keep it in place when, you know, our guys are handling it. It allows us to mount it to a metal board so we can, you know, stake it down in the ground or fasten it to a pedestal or things like that. Um, and sometimes it allows me to cheat a little bit with, with, with gravity or physics. If I want, you know, if I have a vision of something that might be physically possible with Lego, but it just wouldn't hold up over time. Um, that's when I'll use the metal inside to help me, you know, help me do that. I really like the idea of like, really selling you on the magic of what my sculpture is supposed to be about. So you mentioned my hummingbird sculpture, for example. It's this huge thing that's feeding out of a trumpet flower. It's so tall you could walk under it. It's gigantic. Um, and, you know, the the trumpet flowers themselves are the sides of road cones. You know, they're, <laughs> they're gigantic. Um, the whole thing weighs 600 pounds, right? So there's no way it would actually stay up and fly and real, like, like a real hummingbird flies. Um, and so I've got a big heavy piece of steel through the inside of that to help hold it up. Um, but hopefully when you look at it, you don't even think about the fact that it should be impossible, right? Like it should, you should believe the magic that that's, that hummingbird is really there and it's really flying. Of all these sculptures that you've put together and built through the years, are there a few that stand out as your favorites? Yeah, I um whenever I create something, I, I want it to really reflect something that comes from within me. You know, I'm not just content to like smack a bunch of bricks together and be like, look, that's the bird, like whatever. You know, for me, it's what what is this bird doing? Why are we why do we care about this bird? What's interesting about it? Um, and so, you know, I, I I'm I'm a dad and my kids are getting older now. They're my oldest is 13, but as I mentioned, some of these sculptures I made as long as, you know, 12 years ago or so. So a lot of the pieces that I create reflect that that parenting thing that I have within me. Um, I have sculpture of a family of deer, for example, that's a buck and a doe and a fawn. 
and the doe is caring for the for the baby and the buck is sort of standing up on a rock looking scanning the 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 horizon for danger you know that sort of thing and i had made that because i was um fascinated by the fact that when i became a parent i felt those kind of like built-in animalistic primal kind of lizard brain things that that you know the, the man is the provider and the woman is the caretaker and it's silly because you know we're all modern people and i'm a feminist as much as the next person but but it was funny to feel those feelings and so i put that into my sculpture as a way of saying like i can relate to this in a way and and maybe when people look at it they can also relate to it and it kind of almost humanizes the creatures in a way so i do that in a lot of my pieces yes i saw um, a couple of the sculptures that you did that were in sort of colors you wouldn't expect that that sits it, I believe it was in the lobby of an office building oh that one actually um, I did in crazy colors that's the one you're, you're thinking of yes. right with all the yes. weird stripes and everything so I've, yeah. I actually originally did that as a as a life model if you'd call it with with brown and tan and white and you know really looked like real deer and then that uh, corporation wanted a sculpture in their lobby and but they wanted it I've been doing a lot of this kind of crazy pop art stuff with crazy colors and rainbows and things. And they were really fascinated by that. And so I was working with an art consultant who had contacted me about placing that sculpture in their office, but with something more of a sophisticated kind of adult sort of feeling. It's funny, actually, I was talking with that art consultancy for a while um, and they were being very secretive about what company that, that lobby was for. And finally I said, like, is it a big secret? Can, like, can you tell me who it is? And they were like, oh, oh yeah, it's the Lego company. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wait, wait, what? They they have people that do this. Like, I know all those guys. Like, we know each other. We work together on projects. I said, why why are you calling me to make this? Don't aren't they building models for, like for the whole office campus? That they're building a whole new, you know, campus. And they said, Oh, sure, we're gonna have models all over the place. There's gonna be models in the canteen, there's gonna be models in the conference rooms, but this is a sculpture, and we consider that a difference. Well, it was beautiful. I also saw a video where you had finished a piece and noticed that that there was one little tiny square that was the wrong piece. Does that happen very often? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> it actually doesn't, which is why when I noticed that I was sh I, sh I was shocked. I was building this huge six foot tall sculpture of a buck. And again, it was in crazy colors. It was all these vertical stripes. And building vertical stripes, by the way, with Lego is very difficult. Horizontal stripes is trivial. You just build a row and then change your color and build another row. Vertical stripes, they don't want to connect together. You know, Lego pieces have to connect side to side or else they just fall apart. So that was a, a huge undertaking, like structurally on the inside so that I could get this really awesome visual on the outside. When I'm building these sculptures, that that one in particular took me about a month and a half of just standing in my studio all day long. The model's getting taller and taller and taller. And as the model gets taller, I have to get taller. So I end up standing up on, on small risers or eventually platforms. I have to raise my tables up higher so I can still reach my Lego bricks. And then uh, and I'm usually standing on one side of the model. And on the far side of the model, I might have more stands with lights or fans or my, my computer, all these other things. So the whole model was blocked in by all these stands and tables and risers and all this stuff. And when I was finally done, after a month and a half of building, I took all this down and I stepped back and I looked at it and there it was. There was an orange piece right in the middle of a giant yellow stripe. And it was just, it's stuck out like a big ugly sore thumb and i was like oh my gosh <laughs> and so that's the first time something like that's happened because it was such a weird sculpture like i don't usually make these crazy striped colored things and you know being a professional isn't about never making mistakes right it, it, like it's about knowing what to do when you do make a mistake and so in that case, and as you saw in the video, there's no way to take out a Lego brick that's on row 50 of 100. It's it's in there. It's been in there for a month. It's covered by another 20,000 Lego bricks. And so the only solution is to cover it with more Lego bricks in the front. And so I ended up having to re-sculpt the entire, it was on its hip. I had to re-sculpt the entire hip and bits of the leg. Otherwise, it would look like some weird bulgy bit that, that happened, you know, because I had to smack a Lego brick on the outside. So, you know, these things happen and you roll with the punches and you figure it out. But that's part of the fun of it. Yeah, after watching some of your videos, I looked at some of the sculptures, including the ones that we're going to have here at Discovery Park, and uh, you mentioned how challenging it is to get the soft edges. You don't want it to look like it was made out of square bricks, and so you work really hard uh, to give some softness to it. Yeah, exactly. It's really easy to make a Lego sculpture look too stiff, 
right? And and so part of what I always try to do is make my sculptures feel soft. And it's one of and even my colleagues, other people who create art with Lego or other people at the Lego company, like they when they look at my pieces, they're like, oh, that's definitely a Sean Kenny sculpture. Like I've heard them say that before. I don't know exactly what they see in it, but it's something about my process. But but I always try to make them feel really soft and it's also really easy to make them feel digital accidentally, like something very like like not even robotic, but maybe just if it would feel, I don't know, computer generated or something like that, like pixels or something. And so I go out of my way to make them feel softer and more organic, um, more alive. And I, I used to be a cartoonist as well. And so like, I feel like there's some of that sensibility still in me when I look at what I do. I, I think about them almost graphically. Like if you picture like a side view or a front view, there's always like a, like a hero shot, like an angle that I want it to look a certain way. I could do a little two-dimensional drawing and imagine it that way. Um, or even just the way that colors meet up. Like, I don't like, like, I like, like on the deer, the brown stops and immediately white begins on the belly, right? There's no fuzz of, of brown into tan into white. And, and because like that might look nice, um, I don't know, as a rendering or on a computer screen, but like when you build it, that doesn't look right. It does. It just looks pixely dotty weird, like stipples or something like that. And so I, I want it to look really, really good in person when you see it, when it's all done. And so those are a lot of the things I try to do to make them feel less robotic, less digital, less, you know, staticky and, and more, I don't know, more alive. I've always been fascinated by subcultures. Uh, I know that the Lego world has uh, some passionate fans Tell us a little bit about that and how you interact with the fans. Yeah, I, I've, there's a huge uh, Lego fan community um, uh, that you know around the whole world. Um, I've been part of the community f since probably the 90s. Um, we all sort of found each other when the internet was new and didn't realize we were, you know, the only weirdo who was a grown up that was <laughs> still playing with Lego. Um, and when we found each other, we thought, "Oh, this is awesome!" And and what's really great about those kinds of communities, and especially communities of people in a creative, you know, endeavor is that it's really inspirational. You know, like I'll see stuff that other people are doing and be like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And it gives me an idea and then I'll make something and and then that'll give someone else an idea. And and it's neat to sort of watch inspiration chase itself around the internet, you know, as people sort of, you know, lift each other up, you know, the, the rising tide raises all boats. Um, and so we all sort of know each other, you know, like I, I know all the folks that, you know, create art with Lego bricks or, you know, do these sorts of things professionally. I know so many people at the Lego company, so many of the fans have become employees of the company. So many employees of the company, you know, leave and stay fans. And we all know each other. We all work with each other. You know, most of the folks on Lego masters, if you've seen the, the show, I'm very good friends with Jamie, the host. And I was actually going to be one of the judges on the show myself. And I know a lot of the competitors, like we all sort of know each other. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like everybody knows everybody in their industry. Right. And so, um, I don't know, I really love it. And I'm always like poking around on the internet and part of the fan clubs and fan groups. <laughs> That's great. Is there like a big annual event that everybody absolutely has to go to? There are, there, there are many. And, it, and they're all regional, you know, there might be one that's in, you know, Denmark, there might be one that's in China, there might be one that's in, I don't know, the East Coast of the US, that sort of thing. Um, and people often will fly from all around the world. The one in Denmark, for example, is, is it attracts people from literally the entire world, Denmark being the home of the Lego brick. And it's not a Lego company organization, but I think just because it happens to be in Denmark, everybody says, I'm, I'm going to the home of Lego and I'm going to bring some of my cool creations in my luggage and set them up and, and show everybody. And it's cool. It's, it's fun to just walk around those those things and and meet people that you've only known as a portfolio online you see the face behind or the hands behind the work like yeah, it's wonderful we are going to take a quick break and when we get back we're going to ask you all about your book publishing business i'm really fascinated with that aspect of what you've accomplished with nine branches in west tennessee and nationwide atm and branch access you can take leaders credit union with you wherever you go from checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at LeadersCU.com. Leaders is insured by the NCUA. I hope you're enjoying Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to to podcasts. Our guest today is artist Sean Kenny, renowned Lego artist. His exhibitions have been touring globally since 2012, and he has an exhibit coming to Discovery Park this summer from May 3rd to Sept 
September 2nd. Thanks to our friends at Leaders Credit Union. So, Sean, at, at what point did you decide, you know what, this all needs to be a book. And, by the way, as I'm looking at the comments about your books on Amazon, it's, it's really clear that you've inspired a lot of people to tackle their own Lego sculptures by buying and, and utilizing your books. Yeah, thank you. I, I, um, I, I always wanted to make a book. I, I knew I did. I love sharing sort of like the peek behind the curtains at how I do what I do. Um, and when I was a kid, Lego used to have, the Lego company used to have these magazines they called idea books. And they were just little like 32 page magazines. Um, but, but I, I lived in those things because they really were just like, here's what you can probably do with the parts you probably have laying around in the house, you know, and it was just all kinds of little knickknack ideas. And, and I flipped through those things so much. The staples were gone. The, the, the edges were frayed, you know, like I loved those things so much and they stopped making them at some point. I don't know when. Um, and so I realized as I became an adult and as I started doing this professionally, I said, you know what, I, I want to bring that back. I want to actually be able to show people now that I've learned how to do all these kinds of things. Um, you know, I want to be able to share with you what I can do. And so um, it was around that time that I was thinking about doing this, that um, I had a big display at FAO Schwartz, the famous toy store in New York City, and a uh, children's book publisher happened to come by my display. And they uh, saw my name and they contacted me and said, hey, then she was looking at my portfolio and she was like, this could be a book. This could be a lot of books. <laughs> and so that's why we decided to start doing these books. And uh, the first one I did was all about building cool cars and trucks. And I had one about robots and castles. And and eventually one of my books was just, here's the same 35 pieces. What can you make with all those things? And take them apart and put it back together again. So all kinds of different ideas. So Zach here will be promoting this whole exhibit when the uh, sculptures get here and, and when the team comes to install them and they start uh, going up. Which of the... Uh, social media is the many that there are out there now which of them are you on and, and which do you like to use to communicate with your fans believe it or not even though i have a bald spot i also have a tiktok account um <laughs> and i'm on instagram and facebook um i think all the handles are the same it's just sean kenny art um and so if you guys start posting things i'd love to you know, retweet them or whatever the word is now, or, you know, all that stuff. And so I'm always happy to kind of cross pollinate that stuff. Um, I'm even always going up and throwing up little videos and pictures and stuff. Uh, if I catch stuff that, you know, is, is, you know, maybe fans have taken while they're on display, you know, at discovery park and I'll take them and repost them and, you know, Hey guys, it's still open, go see it, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm happy to, happy to share all that stuff and, and, and repost the stuff that you guys make. We and if you guys are going to be like, you know, filming the people and, you know, that are there and like one of the locations, one of my other exhibits was open, still open up in Canada. They were doing an amazing job just filming like, like kids jumping up and down while they were looking at the sculptures and pointing and laughing with their parents and all that. And it just made me feel so good to see all these people having so much fun because I'm not there. I don't get to see it. You guys get to see it. And so I was so happy to just like share that with my fans and put it on my website and everything. So speaking of social media and the younger generation, um, is there anyone following in your footsteps? I know you mentioned you had children. Has anybody picked up the Legos and started trying to out Lego dad? Uh, both of my kids are definitely Lego kids. Like they love it. Um, my 13 year old, she's already getting to the point where she's, she's an artist. She really is an artist and she's getting into drawing, anime, animation, graphic design. She's doing all that stuff. And so her creative endeavors are going that way. My nine year old is still definitely square, square in the Lego camp and is all into like, you know, engineering and, and things like that. In fact, just yesterday, um, my nine year old wanted to come over to my studio after school and have a play date. <laughs> with a friend so that they could just build stuff for like three or four hours. And I thought like, well, I'm kind of working, but you know what? That actually sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I, I also did the play date and we all built together and we made crazy cars and crashed them into each other. And yeah, I just had a great time. So my kids, my kids definitely enjoy it. I think they think my job is normal, you know, because you know, that's just, that's their life. I remember once when my daughter was only about three, she was sitting looking at my wife who uh she works in technology and, and and she was on her laptop doing some stuff and my my daughter said mommy when are you going to get a real job <laughs> and, and my wife was like excuse me i work very hard thank you very much and 
my daughter says, no, you just go to meetings. When are you going to like do things like be a baker or a Lego builder? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's uh, very uh, special that when folks ask your kids what their dad does, they get to say, my dad is a Lego builder. No, there's not. And my nine-year-old actually doesn't realize that. I keep trying to impress on them because they, they, I think I was talking the other day and and they're like, uh, they're like, did you know none of my friends at school, none of their dads build Lego for a living? And I was like, yeah, probably the only one in your whole, whole school. In fact, I could tell you the only one in the entire city. <laughs> and it just, it just blows their minds. Like they have no idea. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to let you go. I know you've got uh, sculptures to build and, and uh, Legos to sort, but I just wanted to thank you for uh, joining us today, but also for making these beautiful sculptures that folks are, are getting ready uh, to come here to Discovery Park to experience. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I, I hope you enjoy them. I hope everybody enjoys them, and, and I really appreciate you having me here today. And hopefully you can come here to Northwest Tennessee and, and visit us one of these days and bring your kids. That would be great. I mean, so it's going to be on display all the way through till September. So maybe I'll find myself out in the neck of woods sometime over the summer and can pop on in. Yeah. If you guys get, if you guys decide to do a family vacation, like to Nashville or Memphis. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, yeah. If you find yourself uh, coming to Tennessee for your summer vacation and going to Memphis or Nashville or Jackson or even up in Paducah, Kentucky, just pop right on over. I was thinking we'll be in New York. That's close, you know, so relatively speaking. Yes, relatively speaking, we're very close to New York. So come and see us. Thank you again. We really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. And thanks to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. And we'll be doing that with Sean Kinney's Lego sculptures that will be here from May 3rd to September 2nd. Thanks to our friends at Leaders Credit Union. To plan a trip for you and your family to check out Sean's Lego exhibit, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.